studies of individual problem areas along the reservoir shoreline were made to determine which of three new approaches to malaria control would be utilized in each area. These approaches, diking and dewatering, deepening and filling, and restricting land use to daytime occupancy, offered permanent values in establishing control and avoided the excessive costs for repetitive measures such as larva siding and marginal growth control. Restriction of land use to daytime occupancy as a malaria control measure was used in the Daniels Landing Area, a timbered upland region of limited agricultural value and supporting a sparse population. Only 150 families lived in the 24,000 acres selected, averaging less than one family per mile of lake shoreline. After being paid a fair price for easement rights, some families tore down their old houses. And with the salvaged lumber, built modern homes. Old household appliances were replaced by more modern conveniences. Other families built new houses. These relocated homes were usually within commuting distance of the restricted areas so that farming or other land use could be carried on during the daytime hours. Some old houses were left in place and converted into barns and storehouses. Others, with framework sturdy enough to withstand the strain, were moved to new locations where they frequently underwent extensive remodeling. Deepening and filling is theoretically the most desirable permanent improvement measure for the control of mosquito production on impounded water because little maintenance is required, reservoir storage capacity is not reduced, and the reclaimed land may be utilized. The shoreline is straightened and shortened by elimination of inlets and shallow bays that might otherwise become problem areas, thus reducing the total area over which control must be maintained. Deepening and filling for malaria control on impounded waters eliminates shallow areas and creates a steeper and more regular shoreline exposed to wave action. Such conditions are unfavorable for mosquito production. Filling is especially useful for the elimination of small pockets along the lake margin where diking and dewatering would not be feasible. The usual reservoir clearance preparations preceded deepening and filling. It was also necessary to remove stumps from the areas to be deepened. Extra heavy charges of dynamite were used in order to shatter the stumps and facilitate their subsequent piling and burning. Bulldozers were used to pile the shattered stumps and to level the ground for the operation of the earth-moving machines. The same equipment was used in this operation that was used in highway, railroad, and dam construction. The deepening and filling operation consisted of borrowing earth from the lower half of a problem area and placing it in the upper half of the area, thus permanently eliminating it as a mosquito breeding problem. On some of the projects, floodlights were installed and operations continued on a 24-hour basis in order to take advantage of favorable weather. Operations involving these unique methods attracted the attention of many visitors interested in malaria control.
The newly created shoreline was graded to an 8 to 1 slope so that wave action would not cause excessive erosion. The problem areas were in the upper three feet of the reservoir, for marginal plant growth as limited variations in the ground level made a highly irregular shoreline. But in creating a new shoreline, these irregularities were eliminated. The actual reduction in shoreline and the various deepening and filling projects amounted to more than 50%. The ground level of the filled areas was raised above normal pool level of the reservoir. While the burrow area was deepened as the other was filled, thus a mosquito breeding area was eliminated. In the largest deepening and filling project, where the Blood River tributary enters the reservoir, more than 400 acres of problem flats were eliminated, and the shoreline was reduced by 20 miles. The improved regular shoreline in the Eagle Creek area represents a reduction of nearly nine miles and promises excellent mosquito control with a minimum of maintenance. An examination of the data of the Eagle Creek project illustrates the economy of deepening and filling in selected areas. A reduction of eight and six tenths miles of shoreline was affected and a total of 155 and one tenth acres of problem flats eliminated. Had the project not been initiated, annual conventional larvicidal control was estimated to cost $4,000 for the area. This was reduced to $900 by the construction of the project, a saving of $3,100 in annual out-of-pocket costs. Selections of projects for diking and dewatering were based on a careful analysis of such factors as size of area, amount of natural drainage, cost of construction and upkeep of the dikes and interior ditching, expected savings in reservoir preparation which would accrue by not having to clear the area of trees, and anticipated income from rental of land behind the dike or sale of timber from this area. The 22 miles of levees or dikes in the eight diking and dewatering projects required movement of one and three quarter million cubic yards of earth. Drag lines of unusually large capacity were used in some of these operations. Tractor powered graders were used to establish the slopes. A typical dike has a very gradual slope on the lake side where it is exposed to wave action. The dikes were sodded to prevent erosion of the slopes. Good Bermuda turf cut by special machines was transported to the dike. The entire slope was not blanketed with sod, as is frequently the practice in other sodding operations. Instead, the sod was cut into small pieces and dropped in furrows about a foot apart. The small cuttings will quickly take root and spread over the slope, thus preventing excessive erosion. At each diking project, electric or gasoline-powered pumping stations were installed to dewater the area behind the dikes during the mosquito breeding season. These plants were built of reinforced concrete and simple modern design. 
They project above the dike high enough to keep the power equipment above the maximum flood surcharge level. Depending upon the size of the drainage area behind each dike, the capacity of the pumps installed at the eight projects ranges from 16,000 to 250,000 gallons per minute. In the largest plant, where pumping is expected to be almost continuous during the mosquito breeding season, six electrically powered pumps were set in place. In more remotely located plants, where intermittent pumping is anticipated during the summer, automatic gasoline-powered pumps are used. The watering of the areas at the beginning of the mosquito breeding season is expected to require from 12 to 24 days each spring, depending on the size of the project. The total area behind the dikes of the eight projects amounts to approximately 9,000 acres. Interior drainage systems were constructed which carried runoff to the pumping station by a series of laterals leading to a main ditch and sump. In some instances, these ditches served immediately the function of draining ponded water from low-lying spots in the dike's area. Interior drainage behind the dikes required the construction of more than 93 miles of ditches and the movement of more than 800,000 cubic yards of earth. The Big Sandy River was diverted from its natural channel for several miles. Railroad and highway fields located in the open reservoir where clearance has been completed require either a broad base with gentle slope or if steeper slopes are used, rip wrapping is necessary to prevent erosion. Highway and railroad fields within uncleared dike areas are protected against wave action. This makes it possible to use steeper slopes. No riprap is necessary. Frequently, the amount of earth required is less than one half of that needed for broad fields. An illustration of these construction features may be found in the Camden area. On the far side of the reservoir, the railroad and highway fill were located in the dike area where they are protected by trees. In contrast, costly rip wrapping was required on the opposite side of the reservoir where the fill would be exposed to wave action. The total cost of permanent malaria control works in the Kentucky Reservoir was $2,664,300. However, economies resulting from alterations in reservoir preparation because of malaria control projects totaled $1,203,350. Thus, the net investment for permanent control works was reduced to $1,460,950 by coordination between malaria control projects and other reservoir preparation. And of fundamental importance is the fact that these capital costs result in a substantial reduction in the recurring maintenance costs which would otherwise be necessary for malaria control. <laughs>